Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening and warm welcome to all. Professor Anna Demir, President of Singapore Management University, Ms. Claire Chang, Senior Vice President and Co-Founder of Bang Yang Chi, Corporate Private Limited, and Chairperson of the Shearing Four Star Program, and distinguished guests. My name is Anne, um, and I will be your MC this evening. Um, year one student from Singapore Management University School of Business. Thank you for joining us this evening as we celebrate our many blessings and give thanks for a year of great accomplishments. And also, we are pleased to present the Diversity and Inclusion Award to our SMU Paralympians who have achieved sporting excellence and are a great inspiration for all of us. So before we invite Ms. Claire Chang to deliver her welcome address, uh, I would like to invite Professor Anna Demir, President of Singapore Management University, to say a few words. Prof, please. Thank you very much. I know you're in the midst of exams and you're still making time to do this. So uh, we should uh, give her a round of applause. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight uh, to uh, be part of this celebration and Thanksgiving. I do miss, think we miss it by a day, right? Uh, Thanksgiving was actually yesterday. Uh, today is the Black Friday, right? Uh, um, uh, and I'm not sure whether you, why you put a, the, the, the celebration here today on a Black Friday. Uh, although that Black Friday is a very positive thing because it's the time that your business becomes positive, right? In terms of revenue, that you're out of the red. Um, so maybe that's what we're celebrating today also. Um, as we know, this event is about a celebration and appreciation of diversity and inclusion. This is something that is very close to my heart. Uh, the fact that we know that everybody has different needs, but they are different. And at this university and in the Shirin Fosda program, we should ensure that people with needs that are different can actually find a home at SMU and uh, for some of you through the Shirin Fosda program. Um, today we are very proud actually that we present these very first Shirin Fosda Diversity and Inclusion Awards to our three Team Singapore Paralympians who are over there. Um, we also mark your outstanding achievements and actually the unparalleled examples that you have set for your colleagues here at SMU, both students and alumni. Pinchu, Seaida and Nurul, we applaud you for being role models for the whole of the SMU community. We celebrate not only because of what maybe SMU has done for you, a little bit, but mainly for what you have done that makes us really proud. You, we thank you for showing us what excellence is all about. You have treaded and led the way in giving your best and excelling in what you do against many odds. A lot of lessons in life are learned beyond the classroom. We know that. In fact, I probably should say the real classroom is the world, not what we have here in, in our buildings. Therefore, we at SMU have actually invested in something that is called life lessons. Life's lessons are helping the students dis to discover themselves, to discover themselves in a team, to discover themselves in society, and in the fourth year maybe to discover themselves as mentor of younger, stu younger students. Life lessons are very important for lifelong learning, and that's the reason why I have been supportive of uh, including that in our programs, in our curriculum. We want uh, to remind the SMU community all the time about the true spirit of excellence and learning. We are also about creating impact on society. That is what we as a university set out to achieve. You have shown us how you have made impact and contributed much more than many of us can. You have advocated for diversity and inclusion through actions and not just through words. You have rallied so many of us together to look up to you in admiration. You have shown us that you are more able and not less. You have demonstrated how the understanding and appreciation of diversity and inclusion can be elevated. It is an important cornerstone that diversity and inclusion, DNI, as we call it here at the university, that guides learning and working at the university. Those in SMU 
would know very well that we are the first local education institution to have initiated a full DNI function. And we do that because we know that we are a diverse group. Our community of students, staff and faculty represent a breadth of talents, identities, religions and cultures and form a microcosm of nationalities. It would be impossible, if not highly impractical, to work if our people or environment cannot welcome all those differences, all those different needs. We also believe that no deserving students, staff or faculty should be denied access or opportunities on, at SMU on the basis of physical, social, economic, religious, cultural attributes or um, um, orientation and other backgrounds. While diversity is our reality, inclusion seldom occurs naturally. We also know that. We are living in a very diverse environment, but that inclusion comes not automatically. It does take effort. It has to be cultivated. So we at the university remain constantly mindful and open-minded about needs and differences in needs. All of us have a role to play, but we need also champions. And that's where we support at SMU the diversity champions, whether it's those helping or those needing help. This includes everyone, because at any point, you and I may have different needs. Support is important, and often we have hidden champions behind the champions. Today, sorry, we also recognize the peoples behind the champions, who may sometimes be overlooked. I hope that initiatives such as today's constantly increase awareness and appreciation to foster at our university, but not only at our university, but in our society in which we operate, a more open, diverse and inclusive culture. Thank you once again for joining us today and please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Professor Anoda Mayor. Now I would like to invite Ms. Claire Chang, Chairperson of the Shearing for Star Program, to deliver her welcome address. Ms. Claire, please. Well, I didn't have a speech, as such, so I was thinking what I have to say after Arnold. So since it's diversity and inclusiveness being set up, I thought I'd describe my life the last two weeks to demonstrate, as he say, how I live it. And it is extraordinary, actually, these two weeks that I actually was feeling that how thankful I am to be in Singapore because I did feel the diversity and inclusiveness in some of the activities I did. The first one was to be involved in ACORD. ACORD is Advisory Council on... Um, community relations on defense. So next year, 2017 is a big year, national service 50. So you're gonna see a lot more. My involvement is to put defense, not just a boy's job. I'm looking at defense as total defense. It's NS for all. It's your job, my job to make Singapore safe. So we go to women's groups, we work with uh, communities, we work with businesses to, um, to understand uh, more of what national service is about, to understand our boyfriends, to understand our spouses who two weeks in a year disappeared somewhere and we don't know where, and they are all these confidences they can't tell us. So it is a wonderful, uh, and I was last month, two months ago in Australia, and uh, there was a military exchange between Singapore and NS, NS boys with, in, in, in Showalter and in Rockhampton. And for the first time, I was in a military helicopter, the Chinook and the Puma. And I have three men in my home, my husband, who is a captain, my two sons, one in the police officer, uh, I think of some rank, and my other son, who is a lieutenant, none of them had been on any of this helicopter. So I felt very proud as a non-NS person or military person that I appreciated what it was all about. That is diversity. And in the accord meeting, we have a lot of issues discussed about women's perceptions on national service, mother's anxiety about uh, NS and how father, son, mother, child bonding can continue. The second uh, diversity was AIG, where I gave a talk just yesterday. And again, the issue on gender equality was being brought up. Um, 
I think I was just talking to Halija, a friend who has long been with me. Where are you, Halija? With me in uh, um, in aware. Uh, I told them, get over it. That the men, that the world is male. So what? Get over it and get on. And I'm making addresses now more on the organizational structures and processes at work that undermine the performance of women. You call it male prejudice, I call it ignorance. I call it a structural barrier, and therefore we need to look at the alternatives and the other ways of working and living. And I was counseled and actually mentored by a younger woman who was only 35 recently in one of our conference on the move visit to Tree Horse, which is a work life uh, 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 station. She's only 35, but she mentored me when she said, um, living well inspires her to work well and better. It's putting life first, her values first, her sense of womanhood and her sense of empowerment first. So she lives well in order to work well. I thought that was very insightful. She is a doctor. She has three babies. That day she came to host us with her one and a half month baby beside her. So it was an incredible uh, sense for us. And I think these are the women warriors who's going to change the landscape of a work environment. And this is something all male bosses have to watch out. How you recruit, how you retain, how you motivate, how you use the woman's talent in the, this millennium. Because this, I truly feel, is going to be our millennium. So that was another diversity in, in, in my visit to Trey Halls, in the talk to AIG. First time is a talk on women inequality, but the hall, half, more than half were men. Unlike a lot of the, uh, the conferences we go to when we talk about women's on, on gender inequality, it's always more women and very few men. And tonight, we have almost quite a fair number of uh, men and women. Again, congratulations to Arnold for creating this culture of inclusiveness that we are all here as well. The fourth diversity uh, um, privilege was the report done by Diversity Action Committee. If you all, all could uh, Google into uh, this report, it's, the, it's, it's actually initiated by Magnus Broker, who used to be the past CEO of Stock Exchange. And therein, again, it's talking about why is Singapore's um, board membership, I mean, female board membership, so low? We are at about 8 to 9%, quite pathetic, compared to the 30% we are hoping to achieve. So in that report, there were a lot of the issues being, being uh, hi highlighted as to what bosses can do, what women should do, what women's group must do to enable women to step out and women to step up and to say, I want to be a board member. And it isn't just male prejudice, huh? because I think the journey actually is a, it's a rather onerous one and, and women have to be prepared for it. We, need, we hope SMU will offer more training, classes to get all the women, and I hope that there's a support from other big companies to get women to understand what is the responsibility of being a board member and how can we encourage headhunters to look at women as directors. And I, I'm going through that journey myself because I sit on two public listed boards in Europe and it is work. It is about travel. It is three days away in, you know, in, in, in far away places. So it does take time and are you prepared for it? And of course, tonight is very special because we have the Paralympians. And I'm so delighted to see Ping Xiu because when I first met her, or rather she see me at Jie she was only 16 then, when we were in Beijing Paralympics. For a long time, I was mentored by someone called Frankie, um, who unfortunately passed away about two years ago. He is one of my coach, in a sense, of, of telling me uh, that the importance of championing disability sports. And for that reason, I went to Athens Paralympics, I went to Beijing Paralympics, and when I was at NMP, I did champion for some of the causes of disability. 
not just sports, but in general. But it was in that two experiences in Beijing and in uh, uh, Athens that I saw the sporting excellence. And today you're going to hear from our uh, stars about their work. But I think it's a diversity that not only uh, th th that we, we have achieved, but I think it is also something that Singapore is so proud of this, this year in particular. And it's all made possible by stars like you. And uh, last of all, I think uh, it wouldn't have walked this far, Shereen Foster started off with a way, came to SMU, had not been the leadership in this university that encourages and facilitates uh, diversity. And I'm therefore, it's a Thanksgiving day, so I have to thank Arnold. I also have to thank two very special persons who sometimes, especially the, the male one, sometimes annoying, sometimes rather rude, son of Shireen Foster, but a friend, someone I admire, someone that I'm grateful for, and, uh, and someone today is so special that they are celebrating, is it today or is it the 17th? 17th, your 60th, 50th? Yeah, they are 68 wedding anniversary. Uh, this is the champion behind the champion that was mentioned by the president. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Jimmy. So I, I thank you also for all of you who braved the rain, the storm, and a Friday night and a Black Friday to be here with us. Without your, um, without you, you are our inspiration for being here. And I hope in you know in whatever you have done with the program, uh, the bookshops you've attended, and the conferences on the move that you visited with us, that you'll continue to do so in 2017. The planner for 2017 is already done, and that should be shown in here. Therefore, you will see that in April, June, July, September, November, we have all the visits planned. So be part of the uh, program. And I hope to see you. And next year at our networking uh, evening, we have just, it's an idea that came out just now, was that we are going to get the uh, 10 to 15 uh, uh, women's organizations together to celebrate uh, and to maybe we should try to time it on Thanksgiving Day so that we will thank uh, uh, all for keeping the women so alive. Um, that's my, the exciting uh, part is in April next year. We have, I looked forward to this because we have commissioned a research done by um, uh, two academics. Although we're going to have a public event on the 22nd where we will share some of the issues related to aging. Um, we wanted to identify the spectrum of needs and illnesses that Singaporeans after 55 face. We also like to examine what are some of the gaps in our service delivery so that we can also establish the continuum of care. And we like to do a comparative study and we also hope to get inputs from the women and the men. All of you have families and have people aging. What are some of the issues? Where do you think we should work harder at? So that we can put together a policy paper for the government because we are all preparing for ourselves. Are yes, definitely. So please mark these uh, dates on your calendar and uh, I hope to be able to uh, see you all soon and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So yes, indeed, uh, the Shearing for Star program has impacted a lot of people through the events and initiatives that are held annually. And in order to encourage efforts and in building inclusion on campus, the SFP has launched a Diversity and Inclusion Award this year to recognize and reward individual or group of individuals from SMU who have made signif significant difference in promoting inclusion on campus and beyond. 
And tonight, we are delighted to present our inaugural group award to our three Paralympians over there who have done SMU and the whole nation very proud. <laughs> May I now invite Professor Anod Demir on stage to present the award. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now give our warmest applause and cheers to welcome on stage the 2016 Shearing Four Star Diversity and Inclusion Group Awardees. Ms. Yip Bin Su, Ms. Noah Shahida, and Ms. Nuru Ashika Taha. May I invite Miss Claire to, uh, to come on stage and to take a group photo together? The one nearest me is Miss Yip Bin Su. She's the Singapore first and only Paralympic gold medalist and made history on 10 September when she clocked the world record at the recent Paralympic Games in Rio de Janeiro this year. She has, she has also won the first Paralympics medal in 2008 in Beijing. Next is Miss um, Noah Shahida Alim. Uh, she's, she was she also an SMU alumna. Oh, I missed one information, my apologies. Ms. Pinsu, she's now a current SMU uh, student. Uh, yeah, the fi she's final year from School of Social Sciences. And Ms. Noah Shahida Alim, she's an SMU alumna from class of 2007, School of Business. She was selected as a national para-archer with Team Singapore in 2014 and her commitment paid off in December 2015 Asian Para Games where she, uh, when she backed two gold medals. She's also the first female para archer to represent Singapore in the Rio 2016 Paralympics. And next, last but definitely not least, is Miss Nora Ashika Taha. Uh, she's also an alumna. SMU alumnus from class of 2003, School of Accountancy. She was the first Singaporean to represent Singapore in Bocha at the London 2012 Paralympics for her contribution towards sports and efforts to make the difference in the lives of people with physical disability. She was conferred the Singapore Youth Awards in 2014. Okay, this is the time for you to get to know the stars more. My job is just to moderate, to take questions, and to uh, find out from these young stars how they did it. Uh, so I will pose the first question, uh -huh. and then um, and have uh, the, the rest uh, to, to ask what they would like to. Uh, uh, you can take some time to say something about yourself, and then uh, the question we've asked of me to ask you, what was your dream as a child? No? Go ahead, no? Definitely when I were to think back the days when I was a child, um, being a, an athlete or even to compete at the Paralympics uh, was not one of my dreams. <laughs> yeah, so um, I picked up sports relatively late in life. Um, I picked it up actually here in SMU. Yeah, so I think today I've come like full circle. Uh, it was actually um, uh, one of the modules that we had to do in year one, which was leadership and team building. So my friends and I got acquainted with um, the sport bocha, and that's where I got started. So um, as a child, I had very similar dreams to, I guess, any other Singaporean child um, wanted to do well in school and um, just 
you know, to be able to um, lead a, a good life. Yeah, I think with um, all of us, the three of us here, we were born with our disabilities, so um, that did not like stop us from dreaming um, to have um, a life just like any other kid, or to grow up and to uh, be a doctor or to be um, a lawyer. So, yeah, my dreams as a child were pretty typical. <laughs> yeah, so when sports came along later on in my life, then that kind of changed my um, dreams a little bit. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, for me, uh, as a child, I guess I have many, many dreams. Um, I, you know, when I was in primary school, I loved reading books and I loved doing composition. So my dream at that time was wanting to become a writer. And then going on to secondary school, um, I liked doing science, chemistry and physics. So my dream at that time was to become a scientist. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I never dream of being an athlete, never expected to be immersed in sports. Uh, what inspired me was definitely my mother. Uh, she uh, encouraged me. I mean, I started out archery as a hobby for many years, uh, during, even during my school days as well. So um, after I graduated from uni, um, I didn't know what to do. I thought, you know, I would immerse myself to my work commitment. So I had a dilemma of whether should I still continue with archery or should I, you know, focus on my work. And my mom said, why not, you know, you've been uh, playing archery for all your life. Why not, you know, go for the selections for a national team. And that's what I did. And never expected myself to go that far. Never expected myself to go all the way to represent Singapore for the major games as well. So, but pushing hard, pushing strong and with the support of my parents and everyone, um, I believe and I, you know, it's really motivated me. Excellent. And please. Well, for, for me, I guess it depends on how old you were talking about. When I was younger, my dream was probably to go to McDonald's to get ice cream. But I think um, from early as when I was 11 or 12 years old, I started uh, competitive swimming. And back then, looking at what um, the, the seniors had already did, how much they've already accomplished, going to the Commonwealth Games, going to the Paralympics, I was very, very motivated to one day get there as well. So uh, 12 years of competitive training um, has led me to where I am today. But I think what I enjoy most about it is really the feeling I get in the water. And that's, that's why I'm so passionate about it. It's because I enjoy it so much. And, and going to the Paralympics at 16 was, was a dream come true. Getting a gold medal back for Singapore was, it, it's still today one of my most memorable experiences. And, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to be able to be on this journey. You know, when I first met you in Beijing, you were relatively, at that time I was with Teresa mm. and with uh, Ang Peng Xiong, who was your coach. Yes. You were very shy. I was very You shy. hardly looked at me or wanted to talk to me. <laughs> and you're quite withdrawn. And now you're there, got the first gold for Singapore. Now, how, how do you describe this journey? Who, who motivated you? What, what, is change? what is the change? So thank you for saying that. Because now when I tell my friends I used to be really quiet, they scoff at me. They're like, no way, you couldn't have been really quiet. Yeah, but um, what motivated me to go on this journey was, at, at first it started with extrinsic motivation. It was something my parents helped me to do. They sent me to training every day. So I went because I had to. Then eventually it was... Um, because my coach was there waiting for me, so I went there because I had to. But eventually, over the years, it has become intrinsic motivation. It's something which I want to do. I wake up early on my own, I go to training on my own, and what motivates me is just wanting to always improve, to be, to be better than I was yesterday. And I know training will help me with that, so that's why I still continue doing this. Your mother motivated you. Are there any one turning point or one incident you could share with us that makes you say, ah, this is what I want? Um, wow, okay. I think, um, I think my mom, she, she really is like, you know, pu keep pushing me to, to, to go beyond my limits. Did you feel the pressure? Uh, no, no. I mean, I, at first, you know, I, I thought this is, you know, why not give it a try? I, I won't know for sure if I don't do it. Um, but, uh, you know, that one step really changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I really thank my mother for pushing me mm -hmm. that far. <laughs> she is the mentor, yeah. yeah? And you know, for you, 
what is there any person or any motivating personal factors that made you push yourself? I've been playing bocha for over 10 years and uh, I always share that, uh, you know there's a saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Yes. So for me, I, I twist the saying a little bit. Um, you know, in, in Malay, um, village is kampong. So I always say I have this bocha kampong that supports me. They are like my, um, my pit stop crew, my sports assistants, the carers, um, technicians, engineers, um, volunteers, coaches. So these are the people who work tirelessly to help um, at Bocha athletes like myself to train. And um, maybe later on you guys can just quickly um, Google for a video on how Bocha is played and you realize that the sport is really for um, individuals with um, severe physical disabilities. So it's really a challenge um, I found that uh, I, I found so far trying to rally the community together to support us. Uh, and that's precisely um, what mot motivates me to know that there's this community, this kampong that supports me in uh, my pursuit for, for sports excellence. And yeah, that keeps me going. Um, in fact, today I have my friends from um, Singapore, uh, from um, School of Accountancy. <laughs> uh, wave hi. <laughs> Yeah, so um, they have been supporting me, uh, giving me moral support uh, since I picked up Bocha back in SMU and then um, when I tried to juggle work and sports. So they are part of my Bocha Kampong. And supporting teams. Yes, huh? so these supporting teams are the people who actually motivate me. So it's really like a, it's a, a vicious cycle, you know, it's a, a healthy vicious cycle that, that just goes, keeps going on and on. Yeah. Okay, now the question from the floor. What do you would like to ask? Yes, Jimmy would be the first hand. I don't really have a question, but when we saw you in the newspapers and television, my wife and I, we are Americans, we are PRs of Singapore, and we wanted to really write a nasty letter to Straits Times because here was Shuling getting more credit with a little bit of glamour over your guts and your grit. Thank you. And that cannot be compared. So we were quite peeved at the manner in which Singapore weighs. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> your reaction? Come on, please, you. Um, I guess it's natural <laughs> for, for, for Singaporeans to do it because the Paralympics is not um, really, con as in we're not really seen on the same foothold. I guess for, for the first time when, when schooling wanted to go, I, even I was, I was so proud of him. I, it, was such a, it was such a moment, but, but we're just hopeful that um, through all our experiences through the Paralympic Games, hopefully Singaporeans will slowly start to begin to see that maybe we shouldn't need to be compared, but should all be equal. Thank you. Anyone to respond to Jimmy? Yeah, just to add on to what Pink Shu said, because after all, um, the Paralympics is parallel to the Olympics. So uh, we, we try not to be so bothered by, you know, what the media or what people in general have to say about the whole thing because they are not there competing, you know, working tirelessly to, to, to win something for Singapore. So we'll just do our own thing and hopefully in the next uh, Paralympic Games, you won't have to write that nasty letter. <laughs> I think we are progressing but very slowly. When I went to the Athens Paralympics, there were only six supporters. I, I was in my NMP, I went there with Charles Chong. There are only two of us. We didn't have a Singapore flag. We didn't have enough voice to cheer. So what we did, we engaged the, our Southeast Asian friends to say that when they shout Singapore, you shout with us, like the roll call. When it is Malaysia, we shout with you. So there was just two of us and there was no send off, there was no welcoming back. Although I think even then we won some bronze. No, no, not in Athens. In, not in Athens. Yeah, we in won Be nothing. In Beijing. Yeah. We, we came back with uh, 
What do we come back with Beijing? Your goal. Uh, one goal and um, <laughs> Beijing. One goal, one silver, two bronzes. Yeah. But then the second yeah. time in Beijing, we had a minister mm. who went with us. Mm. Minister Tio Salak. Mm. And uh, that's why we have some bit of a send-off and something of a welcoming back. And we got a gold. And uh, during the normal part, uh, Olympics, they didn't get anything. Mm. Now, this time, okay, schooling got a lot of the... <coughs> but I also think we have moved... Yeah, and they went to the parliament, etc. But we can do more. We can do better. Yes, Liz. Hi, ladies. Um, just like to say thank you for um, going for your dreams and for showing the rest of us here that we have no excuse for not chasing our dreams. And one, the question that I want to ask is, um, how has um, your uh, um, sporting experiences changed you? For me, I think swimming or sports in general has really shaped most of my life. But if I were to say like one biggest takeaway would be uh, learning how to bring that determination and discipline I have into other areas of my life. So I wasn't a very good student uh, when I was in secondary school. Um, but Swimming was a very big part of me. So every day, we, we train for 13 times a week, uh, swimming in the morning, going to school, and then going back to the pool for, for like this all the way until painting. And after painting, I did my O levels. And then my results weren't fantastic. I thought to myself, uh, since I, would, I was able to be world champion at swimming, why can't I be good at my studies as well? So that's when I thought, okay, let's take a year of swimming. Let's really focus on um, my studies. That would have been my priority for the entire year. And uh, really, I found the discipline and the determination which I put in for swimming into my studies. And, and I did pretty well for in my poly days. And that's why I made it to SMU. <laughs> yeah, but it's really this, this kind of things where you can't really learn it in school, but you, you have to learn it through life experiences. Wow, first poly and then change to SMU. Such determination. And that's how it shaped your life. Uh, for me, sports has uh, built my self-esteem, my confidence in myself as well. Um, I, I was, I was uh, introvert, you know, before sports. Uh, but through sports, I become more, you know, brave and uh, more confident in what I'm doing, uh, more focused as well. Um, in archery, um, one way to perform is definitely a consistent follow-through. And, and all this uh, requires a lot of focus. Um, so through the skills that I have gathered uh, as an archer, uh, it follows me in my work life as well. Become more focused, uh, prioritize what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. Yeah. Sports has definitely made me a more adaptable person and that's a very important skill, especially with the world changing so rapidly now, to be able to have that skill and transfer it into my daily work. Uh, I also work as a text auditor, so uh, text. yeah, text, text, text auditor. auditor, yes, yeah, so yeah, so sports wise, um, yeah, I think sports has given me the opportunity to travel, but with traveling, I've had to adapt to new environments, uh, definitely pushing myself out of my comfort zone. Um, yeah, because it's like a duty as an athlete to, you know, quickly adapt to new environments and perform the best that you can. So to be able to, you know, uh, really work on that skill and then bring it back to um, my day, I call it my day job, <laughs> yeah, as a tax auditor, I think has come in pretty useful, yeah. Any questions from that quarter? From anybody else? Can, can you share one lowest moment and how you overcame that? Whether it was the race or whether it was a coach's command, whatever. A moment you felt so low but something happened and how do you get over it? Because you have shown such discipline, focus, determination, and courage. And the hours you have put in to win the game is tremendous. I mean, it's tremendous. But I'd like to know 
When is the lowest moment and how you overcame? I guess there must be a lot of points in my life where I've gotten a not so positive feedback from my coaches and everything. But one thing about me is that I don't really harp on the negative things. So I don't really remember if I don't really remember like oh, maybe four weeks ago my coach scoped me on this day and day. But I, I don't remember it. So as long as I feel that sometimes it's easier to let go of grudges and things uh, or feeling of negativity because only with a positive outlook would you be able to pass through um, barriers a, a bit smoother. Yeah. But maybe if I were to pick a point, I can really only remember one point where I thought of giving up. It must be um, way back when I was uh, maybe after London. I, I, I didn't know if I still wanted to continue uh, because my results were very stagnated. Uh, I was facing a plateau. And How no, old were you then? I was... Um, 20 years old. Yeah, so no matter how much I train, how much effort I put in, I was still, my, my timing would still not get better. Mm. Yeah, but I asked myself if it was time to retire yet, and deep down inside, there was just, immediately I didn't have to think, it was just this voice saying, no, it's not, it's not time yet. It's time, it's just, just continue going on, pushing on, and, and I did, and eventually things worked for the better. We found a a new team, a new program and everything, and then things started improving from then. But I'm just really glad that I didn't quit because things weren't moving forward. Mm. But you worked even harder. Mm. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, I guess my l lowest moment was definitely my first competition. Um, that would be the Singapore Archery Open uh, mm. last year. Um, it was the first time where, um, you know, uh, showcase uh, what my skills as an archer will be like before uh, ASEAN Para Games. And I didn't do very well. I was probably at the bottom 16. I still managed to qualify for the elimination round, uh, but my score wasn't, was below average according to my coach. And when he told me that, you know, that um, I can do better and my scores was really not what I expected it to be, I was very disappointed with myself, but um, he turned around and he also said that forget about today, uh, push forward for tomorrow. And that's what I did. I managed to get all the way to the finals, um, got, my, got my first bronze for, for my first competition. Yeah, and that's what motivates me to push even harder for the next one. Um, as an athlete, definitely there are a lot of highs and lows, and but I can't really think of a particularly super low point. Definitely every time I lose a match after that, I'm of course feeling very low, but you just have to pick yourself up. Um, but I, I find reminding myself um, not to lose focus on the bigger picture helps to recover from whatever low points after losing a match or like not doing well in, in any aspect of life. Because life goes on, um, there's, there's still something bigger out there that you're trying to, trying to work towards. So just keep going at it, I guess, yeah. That seems like the one quality that we really have to learn from these three stars, that resilience and that very positive attitude towards life. Let's give them a round of applause for that. Yeah. So my last question to, to end this, unless those who are burning to ask a question, you stand up and interrupt me. My last question is, um, will you be at the next Paralympics? <laughs> just say la. It's okay. We don't, hold, we don't hold you to it. Just say <laughs> Well, training, training was real. Was training for real was really, really, really tiring. <laughs> sure. So, um, at, after that, we were like, "Well, we need a good break to in order to reassess everything." But uh, for now, I know I still want to be sw uh, training swimming competitively for two years. <laughs> so I'm taking I'm taking a break now. I'll start back in January, when also when I start my school semester. <laughs> 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 so not sure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, for me, I'm currently at my off-season for archery, uh, but I still continue uh, doing self-practice on my own and sometimes with my coach as well. So through a lot of practice, hopefully uh, we'll be able to go for the next one. Good for you. Um, for me in Rio, uh, 
together with my partner, we finished fourth. We lost the bronze medal match. So I guess our job is not done. So we're going to be back for revenge. So Tokyo 2020 is on the plan. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of this session. Uh, I hope you, we have about 15 more minutes to spend some time taking photographs with our stars or have a chat with them and uh, have more drinks around and get to know one another for this networking session. So thank you all for being here and early greetings for a festive Christmas and uh, Happy New Year. And thank you all, young stars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Chang, and the, our three um, Olympians, uh, Paralympians, yes. Um, and once again, I would like to thank you, Ms. Chang, and the SAP Advisory Board for always recognizing uh, SMU students and alumni. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our networking evening. On behalf of SMU and the Shearing for Star, Program Committee. I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us here today and we look forward, forward for your participation in our upcoming events. I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you.